Okay, so I made a video explaining the Ukraine-Russia conflict in 10 minutes. I made a Geography Go video where I actually went to Ukraine. Now there's only one thing left to do. The actual Ukraine episode. It's time to learn geography now! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. Get your Geography Now merch like this Geography Now t-shirt or mug at geographynow.com. It's like McDonald's, you know, we only have like 10 things on the website. It's not that hard to choose. In any case, it's not selling out if it's your brand. Gonna put the mug away. So as you guys know, I actually went to Ukraine. Thank you to visitukraine.today. They wanted to sponsor me to not only go to Ukraine, but also to learn more about their country, despite it being in the middle of a war. And also thank you, United24 Media. They also helped me get some great footage and interviews with some exclusive people that you'll see in this video. And speaking Speaking of guests, as you know, I love having guest hosts from the country. And with that, say hi to Mr. Misha, our Ukrainian correspondent. Hello. How you doing, Misha? Good, how are you? Anything you want to just say about Ukraine to the world out there? Yes, I bring you some really cool flag. You can read actually in Ukrainian as a freedom. V, this is L, this is O, and Ya. Volia, in Ukrainian, freedom. We'll explain more about this in Flag Fan Day and all this. <laughs> so yeah, you ready to start the episode? Yes, let's do I it. am. Let's do it. Wow, you have really white teeth. <laughs> So Ukraine is a complicated country and not just in a contemporary sense, but like in a every possible way sense. And it's definitely not easy to summarize, especially the part we are about to get into. Mm -hmm. Little disclaimer, we will be portraying what is internationally recognized and constitutionally part of Ukraine as per the Belozheva Accords and the Budapest Memorandum post-USSR breakup. Uh, with that, here's the motion graphic. First of all, Ukraine is the largest country entirely within Europe, located in the eastern part of the continent, bordering seven countries with the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov in the south. The country's capital and largest city is Kyiv, located in the north central part of the country. Just outside the city, on the east side of the river, lies the largest and busiest international airport that services Kyiv, Borispil International. However, there is a more localized, smaller airport near the city center on the west bank of the river, Giuliani International. From there, the second and third largest cities, Kharkiv and Odessa, host the second and third largest and busiest airports, Odessa and Kharkiv International. Keep in mind, as of the onset of the Ukraine Russia war, all air travel has been suspended and grounded until further notice, and the only way to enter into the country is either by land transport from all surrounding countries other than Russia and Belarus, as well as the Russian military-occupied region of Transnistria in eastern Moldova. Travel via Black Sea to the port of Odessa is also possible, but has come with a degree of precaution during conflict times due to the proximity of Russian involvement on the Crimean Peninsula. Speaking of which, subdivision-wise, the country is made up of 24 oblasts, one autonomous republic, Crimea, and two special status cities of Kyiv and Sevastopol. Now here's where things get more complicated. Even before conflict times, Sevastopol was considered a separate administrative entity from the rest of Crimea, which was already labeled as autonomous, and was even a closed city during the Cold War. As of 2014, Russian forces have annexed the Crimean Peninsula and special status city of Sevastopol, which currently hosts Russia's naval Black Sea fleet. In 2016, Russia started constructing Europe's longest bridge, the Crimea Bridge, a 12-mile, 19-kilometer long bridge that spans across the Kerch Strait. Effectively, this connected Russia with the Crimean Peninsula for the first time. To this day, only eight heads of state of eight countries have announced recognition of the Crimean Peninsula belonging to Russia, whereas the rest of the world either does not recognize it or still recognizes it as distinctly part of Ukraine. In addition, the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts had military-armed Russian-backed separatists that seized government buildings and claimed their own republic status. Later in 2022, Russia announced that they would annex them and in what the United Nations General Assembly labeled as an attempted illegal annexation. Since 2014's Crimean Peninsula annexation, Ukraine has been in an ongoing war with Russia, and in 2022, Russian forces have entered and occupied parts in the east and south of Ukraine. There was an attempt in the north, but Ukraine was able to regain territory, and as of making this video, the situation is ongoing and ever-changing. Yeah, Ukraine's domain is definitely a topic of long discussion. And by the way, it's Kyiv, not Kyiv. Kyiv, it's a Russian version of Ukrainian capital, Kyiv. Also, so you might hear the term Donbass quite a bit, referring to the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts furthest on the east bordering Russia. The name is a portmanteau of the word Donetsk Basin. Donbass, it's the front line of Ukrainian fight. Historically, in the past, Donbass was one of the most industrialized area in Ukraine. So how did all this crazy stuff happen? Not easy to explain. The whole conflict wasn't just a 2002 issue. You have to go back in time. Oh, you mean like the 2014 year Euromaidan protests? Annexation of Crimea? The Donbass separatist wars too? Well, those, those some things led to it. Or do you mean the 2008 Yushchenko political crisis? Or the 2004 Orange Revolution? Well, I mean... Oh, oh no, wait, let me guess. You're bringing this back to the Soviet.
Soviet collapse and all his accords that were signed in the 90s. That played a huge role, but... Wait, is this about Khrushchev handing over Crimea in 1954? I mean, if you want to add that in there, then fine, but that's not exactly... Pre-Soviet? Really? Oh, you have no idea how far back this conflict is going. Yeah. Basically, I made a video covering this topic, so we don't have time to spend 80 years scratching the surface. Reference videos are a great way to save time! High five, yeah! Historically, Ukraine was occupied by the different civilization through the history. In fact, the oldest excavated culture being the mysterious Neolithic Tripillian culture. Crimean Peninsula was part of so many different uh, empires in the past. It was the furthest extent of the Golden Horde, you know, back in the 13th century. Wait a second, hold up. Did you just say that part of Ukraine was Mongol? Eh, a little more complicated than that, more like a Kipchak Turkicized offshoot version of them, but technically kind of yes. Grab me a river. <laughs> In any case, it wasn't until the 9th century that the Kievan Rus was established and it was essentially the home of the Eastern Slavs. The word Rus was invented by Viking for the Slavs. If you know uh, your Nordic history, basically went like this. I'm going west. Well, I'm going east. Uh, I guess I'll go north? Okay, that's enough history. Let's talk about something else. Let's Famous places. Famous places, yes. And uh, who better to do it than some actual Ukrainians? Here you go. Hi guys, <laughs> my name is Tony. Hi guys, my name is Maria. Here are just some of famous places. Eight UNESCO heritage sites. I'm including the first one, St. Sophia Cathedral, the oldest cathedral in Eastern Slavic countries. Key features Klavra. A lover is a large and important monastery. Uh, Odessa city and Odessa has uh, Potemkin stairs. We have our own study of liberty. Yeah, that's right. We have the love town. Um, Baturin was once the capital of the Cossack hetman on the left side of Ukraine. Sofivka Park. Yeah, Sofivka Park. Beautiful in spring and summer. Uh, we have so many castles and fortresses in Ukraine. Madeline Monument in Kiev. The ancient Baba Stones. And finally, Chernobyl. For To this day, 2,600 square kilometers, uh, exclusion zone, deemed unsafe for habitation. But people are still curious and love to visit and has become a top tourist destination in their recent years. And I for forget about uh, Pripet. Pripet, yeah. yeah, it's the city inside. Yeah. And yeah. hope you can visit Ukraine. Yeah, Slava Ukraine. Heroin, Slava. Slava Nazi. Thank you, Tony and Maria. Hey, did you know Ukraine might have the geographic center of Europe, the village uh, Dilove? Oh uh, no, I actually been. <laughs> it's a forest and cross and that's it. <laughs> hey, I did that. <laughs> okay, gone. So there you go, a complicated map with complicated backstory and even more complicated mode of operating itself. Uh, Ukraine is not a simple country. No, it's not. But one thing that does seem to be quite simple is the landscape of Ukraine. It's a little bit flat. <laughs> a little bit, most of it. Yes. Yeah. And with that, let's move on. Physical geography. So, on the surface, Ukraine looks um, like mostly flat country with a little bit of uh, fluctuation topography. But it goes so much more deeper than just farms. Ukraine's land is an absolute resource powerhouse that feeds not only themselves, but much of Europe. We'll talk about that soon. In the meantime, here's the motion graphic. For one, the majority of Ukraine lies on the East European plain. This is an enormous stretch of generally flat plains and plateaus that extend all the way to what are considered the geographic borders of what constitute Europe along the Ural and Caucasus Mountains. Mountains. Within Ukraine, the landscape essentially slopes downward west to east, starting in the furthest southwestern part of the country where you can find the highest elevation in the Carpathian Mountains. Here you can also find the tallest peak, Hoverla, in the Zakarpatia Oblast. The Crimean Peninsula is the only other place that has a notable mountain range within the country, averaging around 1,500 meters high. The peninsula is only connected via the Perekop Isthmus, which at its narrowest is only about 3 miles or 5 kilometers wide. Otherwise, the rest of the peninsula is separated by shallow lagoons lagoons and bays with the 70 mile 112 kilometer long skinny Arabat Spit or the Arabat Arrow, a barrier island that separates the Sibash Lagoon from the Sea of Azov. From there you have the Podolian and Dnieper Uplands in the north, the Polisian Lowland and Dnieper Lowlands across the longest river of the country, the Dnieper River, that essentially bisects the country in half, emptying into the Black Sea near the city of Kherson. The Dnieper River is the lifeline of the country containing several hydroelectric power stations and dams that have effectively created 
its reservoirs along its banks, which is why it looks like such a fat, wide river on maps and satellite images. In terms of freshwater lakes, the country has tons and tons of small ponds and lakes along their forests and plains. However, the largest inland body of freshwater would be Lake Yalpa in the Odessa Oblast, not far from the Danube River that separates them from Romania. Yes, that is correct. Ukraine is the last country the mighty Danube River gets to encounter before it drains into the Black Sea. And speaking of which, if you're afraid of deep water, probably the best place where you can learn how to swim is Azov Sea, because it's so shallow, you can walk in hours and hours and hours and it's never get deep. Oh really? Yeah. In any case, although most of the country is flat, it is loaded with export material. And, uh, and you guys really love your coffee. Like I went to Lviv, there uh, I believe Lviv has more cafes per capita than anywhere else in the world. There's like over 1,500 cafes. Yeah, and the coffee in Lviv, it's amazing. And uh, speaking of coffee, it's time for my triple shot espresso break. And with that, here's Noah to explain a little bit more on the trade sector. Take it away, Noah. All right, Jogger peeps, time to make sure that you know a few things. As an agricultural powerhouse, Ukraine is often touted as the breadbasket of Europe, as they have a huge share of wheat and barley exports. They are also often ranked the number one producer of sunflower seeds in the world. This is because about two-thirds of their land is arable, and much of it blessed with the rich Chernozem soil. It is characterized by its dark black color containing high percentages of phosphorus and humus, perfect for crop cultivation. Hummus? Not hummus. It's soil made of decomposed organic material rich in nutrients and has a high moisture retention. Organic material with high moisture? I mean, that's not that far off from hummus. Sure, whatever. Can you make humus out of hummus? You don't get to talk anymore. In any case, despite having a mixed economy made up of industry, energy, mining, and manufacturing sectors, they have remained one of the lowest income nations in all of Europe and is classified as a lower middle income economy. This is due to many factors such as hyperinflation in the 90s, monetary expansion due to government spending. The largest hit though would have to be their cutting of ties to their former largest trading partner, Russia. Since then, their trade with the EU has increased dramatically, mostly going through Poland. Ukraine is also a mining powerhouse, hosting about 90 different minerals, 20 of which are economically significant. Today, Ukraine operates four nuclear power plants, including the largest in Europe, in Zaporizhia. There used to be five plants, but we all know about the Chernobyl disaster in 1986, the largest nuclear accident to date. Nobody is allowed to move or give birth there. However, a few elderly inhabitants are allowed to remain in their original homes where they live quietly and receive aid. Weirdly enough, this actually became one of Ukraine's largest tourist destinations post-Soviet breakup. It was like, it's so sad, so devastating. Hey, can I see it? This isn't a joke, we have to block it off. But I'm a disaster enthusiast. I'll pay you a lot of money. Okay, give me your money. And that's how that industry started. They also have their own domestic automobile manufacturing plants and brands, the largest being Zaz or Zaporizhian Autos. In addition, Ukraine is one of the nine countries with a full cycle of aerospace hardware engineering and production. They're probably most famous for their production of large-scale Antov and Ruslan cargo transport jets, including the AN-225 Mria, the largest transport aircraft ever created. Unfortunately, on February 24, 2022, it was destroyed in a Russian attack while parked in a hangar at the Antonov Airport. Plans have been made to rebuild it though. That was a lot of heavy detail. However, one person that always lightens a heavy mood would be our resident animal correspondent, Gary Harlow. Let's roll. Gary Harlow here. Eh? Time to fly into this like a Ukraine. First of all, Ukraine is a treasure trove of flora. You can find the national flower marigolds everywhere. And thanks to the cooler wet climate, Ukraine is able to harbor over 6,600 species of identified fungi and many more probably still undiscovered. It really is the mushroom kingdom. Oh no, the Nintendo missiles are coming. <laughs> In some of the forest and mountain regions, animals like wolves, brown bears, lynxes, martens, and boars can be found. Birds are a huge part of Ukraine's ecosystem. Over a hundred species are either native or migrate to Ukraine. If a little egret or white stork make a nest on a telephone pole or on top of your house, it is said to be good luck. It's like, you have been chosen for my blessing. The national animal though is the nightingale, known for being able to mimic sounds it hears and repeat them back. They would be like, you have been chosen for my blessing. Oddly enough, due to the lack of human activity, animals are repopulating and thriving in Chernobyl. Even the famous Shevolsky horse, one of the most endangered in the world, known for their shorter, stockier, chunkier bodies. Speaking of short and chunky, I've got a baby daughter to feed. Cheers, mates! 
Thanks, Gary. Speaking of mushrooms, a favorite pastime of many Ukrainians is mushroom picking in the forest, as many of the species are edible and used in their cuisine. The cuisine of Ukraine is definitely worth it. To talk more about it, we have a very special guest star, possibly the most famous chef in Ukraine, Mr. Klopotenko. Take it away to the food! Uh, introduce yourself. So, my name is Yevgen Klopotenko. Uh, I'm Ukrainian chef and I'm the guy who is changing the food culture in Ukraine and I'm trying to put Ukraine on the world's map. Also, right. stand up, show your pants. That's my pants. The Cossack yeah. Pants. Okay. So uh, the most famous uh, uh, appetizer is like our pork fat or salo because we we, uh, we were not using a lot of butter. The most important dish for the Ukrainian cuisine it's a borscht. It's uh, our main main dish and now it's uh, from the first of July of 2022. It's a World Heritage dish. Neko's dish is called sirniki. Uh, we're just frying that mm -hmm. and uh, it's very nice. So uh, the third dish it's called uh, dumplings or we call it vareniki. But uh, in Ukraine uh, it's very famous to to use the sour cherry and the poppy seeds. Chicken kiev. Oh, I love chicken. Yeah, chicken kiev. Uh, chicken fillet uh, and inside it has a uh, butter. Bu 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 butter and some deal normally. Can you cook chicken kiev with salo? <laughs> I would try uh, that. That would be super Ukrainian. Yeah, no, it will be super fat. <laughs> so? <laughs> so, I mean, oh, yes. I mean, I mean, you also Kiev cake, uh, some kind of meringue with the uh, nuts. Quasi sour, nice. quasi sour, it's like fermented bread uh, drink. And uh, we're putting this uh, kwas uh, on top of the meat. It's called Vereshaka. Last question favorite dish you can cook? <laughs> Me? <laughs> Do you have a signature dish? Borscht. If you want to touch borscht, you have to touch me. Touch me. Bam! Oh, I, I yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. You feel it? All right. Well, I think that's it. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank Explain you. Food. Yeah. You you thank you. Now. Yeah. Thank you, chef. And with that, I will take my leave. Back to you, Barb's. <laughs> Thank you, Noah. Yeah, also, Ukraine have a quiet uh, culture around the bread. From my research, you guys have over 80 kinds of ritual breads. Oh, my mom also, she cooked uh, this uh, bread, it's called korovai, and it's now become an intangible heritage of Ukraine. of Ukraine. Well, in any case, uh, just like the food, the people of Ukraine have so many unique traits and flavors to them. Let's discuss that. So, uh, Misha, your opinion, what is a Ukrainian person? It's a person who have a Ukrainian heart. No matter where you live, no matter who you are, what color you are. I live in the US, I live here, but I still have a deep attachment to the culture and uh, people. You can take the Ukrainian out of Ukraine, but you can't take the Ukraine out of them. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> so, Ukraine's population has gone through major fluctuations over the past three decades. Their population actually peaked in 1993 at 52 million. However, factors like mass emigration and for a while having a higher death rate than a birth rate made Ukraine's population population declined sharply. And also, depending on which census you rely on, population statistics of Ukraine might conflict because some include or don't include Crimea and the Donbas Oblast of Donetsk and Luhansk. As of 2023, Russia has annexed over 90% of Luhansk Oblast and the half of the Donetsk Oblast, including the capital Donetsk. With all that taken into account, due to the conflict times displacing people across the country, ethnic group numbers have fluctuated and there's no concrete way of getting exact numbers, but this is the general demographic makeup I got by averaging out numbers from as many sources as I could find. Here we go. The population of Ukraine as of 2023 is around 42 million, which is a rough estimate that includes the returned diaspora, but also does not include the Crimean population around 2.5 million, and shaving off some of the 2.5 million population living in annexed populations of the Donbas region, but does include the half million of Ukrainians in Ukraine-controlled areas of the Donbas. It seems the country is, of course, predominantly made up of people that identify as ethnically Ukrainian at somewhere around 80%. There, somewhere around 17% of the nation claims to be ethnic Russian. Keep in mind, these lines are kind of blurred because many people are also mixed between both Ukrainian and Russian parents, and many may claim either side depending on who you talk to, but this seems to be the general number. From there, the remaining population is made up of various other ethnic groups, mostly from neighboring nations like Romanians, Hungarians, Polish, Ukrainian Jews, Pontic Greeks, and yes, even a small population of Koreans. In any case, quickly, the country used hryvnia, it's a national currency, uh, we use type C and F block outlet and we drive on the right side of the road. In Ukraine, the official language obviously is Ukrainian, an East Slavic language descended out of the medieval Ruthenian language. Russian is also common spoken secondary language through the obviously it was introduced during the Russian Imperial era and Soviet Union. Also, uh, there's Sujik. What is Sujik? Explain. 
Surik is my first language actually with uh, which I grew up. It's a kind of mix of Ukrainian and Russian but also have a lot of different words which doesn't exist anywhere else. Since 2014 a lot more people have just started speaking Ukrainian, right? Like, yes. Yeah, like yeah. they kind of... Yeah. Right? I still continue to speak uh, in Surik with my family like mom, dad and my best friends but Ukrainian it's more common language what you use in the country. It's obviously changed. The closest languages you guys can understand are probably Belarusian and Polish maybe? Or? Uh, yeah, I think like if you, uh, if uh, anyone speak in uh, Belarusian, Polish, Czech language, you can understand easily. Oh, you can understand Czech too? Yeah, yeah. Wow, okay. Speaking of which, near about three quarters of all Ukrainians claim to be affiliated with the Eastern Orthodox Church uh, and then 10% being Catholic. You Mostly in the Western West part. part. Yeah, yes. like by yes. Lviv. And the Southern part, it's a Muslim. Now, there are quite a few regional customs between Ukrainians like you know you have the Hutsul Ukrainians and the Carpathians and you have the Bukovina Ukrainians but nothing exemplifies the Ukrainian identity more than the Cossack spirit right yes it is yeah what is a Cossack Cossack is eventually mean free men it's actually people who was, doesn't want to be part of Polish Lithuanian and also Russian Empire they was made from uh, exile from both places and want to build free society from monarchy kind of sounds like a country of just adventurous people. Yes, it is. The exact origins are disputed, but in a nutshell, they stem from semi-nomadic peoples in the Pontic Steppe and Caspian Steppe regions somewhere around the 13th century after all that crazy shit with the Mongols went down. Oh, and I think the peak of the Cossack's culture was when the Bogdan Khmelnytsky was in power because he established the border and capital. They were right in between two major empires, the Russians and the Polish-Lithuanians, and uh, when said states saw these Cossacks, it was like, hmm, those Cossacks are very rough and militaristic, and they're like very hell-bent on maintaining their autonomy. Why don't we use that to our advantage? Uh, how so? They love fighting, so why don't we just hire them as mercenaries to fight our battles while promising them autonomy? Hmm, I mean, I really do want to expand past the Urals, and you have that whole beef with the Ottoman Empire. Right, yeah. right. Wait, don't we hate each other too? Long story short, but Cossacks have always been a central part of Ukrainian culture and identity. Wait, don't you guys also have like a Cossack cartoon like called Kozaki? Yes, it's a <laughs> three Cossacks, they always uh, fight with Russians. In any case, uh, you need to be strong and fierce when competing in sports. So with that, let's jump over to the sports part with art. Merry Christmas, even though it's not Christmas. All right, let's get started. Take him. Alrighty, peeps. Let's get Ukraine in the membrane. You know that song like, insane in the membrane. Never mind. Ukraine and sports have always gone hand in hand. So much so that in fact they have created their own like combat hopak, a martial art that was invented by Zaporizhian Kozaks that mixed traditional dance with fighting. There's also traditional hopak saber fencing and wrestling. You played a Kozak in the Russia episode, remember? I do remember that. Yeah, I was really pent up and angry. Ukraine has competed in every Olympics as an independent nation since 1994. Since then, Ukraine has racked up nearly 150 medals at the Olympics as of 2023 with 38 golds, the best events being gymnastics and wrestling. Larissa Latina is a total national treasure. Competing under the Soviet Union, out of any male or female, she held the record for 48 years with the most gold medals at nine, and overall she won 18 medals over the course of three Olympic Games. In terms of wrestling, Ukraine has many champions. But a huge deal in wrestling would be Jean Belyanuk, who got the gold in Tokyo Olympics, and we got him on the show. Barbs was actually able to interview him in the Ukraine episode here. Here's a quick snapshot right here. Hey everyone, my name is Jean Belyanuk. I'm uh, Afro-Ukrainian. I'm Olympic champion in Greco-Roman wrestling and uh, member of Ukrainian parliament. My first big win, is, uh, it was uh, first place in European championship. Mr. Zelensky, we know each other before that. And he uh, uh, told me about he want uh, to invite me. What was your life like growing up in Ukraine? I was born in 1991 when Soviet Union just collapsed. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. And uh, new country, new rules, mm -hmm. and that's why. And I was only with my mom, uh, guys, with my type of skin, <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah. and different, di different, difficult situation. But uh, do Ukrainian people generally accept you? Ukrainian people are very uh, tolerant, you know, and uh, I have a lot of um, friends. School of life, you know. Yeah. 
Uh, and uh, that's why maybe I decided to go into Greco-Roman wrestling. Yeah, and now you're in the parliament. Now you're a famous uh, gold medalist. Are you happy? Uh, yes, I feel honored. Uh, after, after Barack Obama. You I feel think like Ukrainian oh, Barack Obama. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so much, man. <coughs> and I yeah. appreciate that. Thank you, Jean. Such a cool guy. Anyway, there are so many other things that we could highlight in Ukrainian athletics, like the Boxing Brothers, the two-time World's Strongest Man winner, that dude who broke over 35 pole vaulting records. But at the end of the day, you must mention FC Dymino, Ukraine's most popular football club. They have won dozens of USSR championships and UEFA Cups. And number seven, the Ukrainian dream, Andrei Chevchenko, who won a for the best player and best score. He won two bronze and one golden ball award. Today he's doing good and he enjoys playing golf in his spare time. Oh, don't we all just want that? To look back at all the glory and just play golf in our spare time. Get out of here, Art. That's right, giving up on life, baby. <laughs> I'm gonna play some golf. Thank you, Art. It's important to mention the acrobatic school in Ukraine is also really big. Yeah, like Ukraine's got talent. There's always like 50 different acrobatic acts yeah, or something. True. Anyway, so many things about the culture. You know what's gonna happen. Hannah is gonna take over that. Random Hannah, take it away with the culture segment. It's the culture segment. It's insane. We're in Ukraine. <laughs> So what are some of the things that are distinctly Ukrainian? For one, you have to kind of look at the root. Historically, Ukraine's had a significantly different climate and different rich soil from their Russian neighbors. This influenced so many things in daily life, like traditional Ukrainian white clay thatched roof houses versus wooden Russian cabins. Many historians also attribute this as being a factor to why Ukrainians have a more individualistic based culture due to the fact that single families could be completely self-sufficient on their own land, as opposed to the more collectivist Russians that had fewer immediate access to resources and needed to depend on a larger community to operate. It's a theory. Make of it what you will. In any case, the national dress is the Vishivanka, and the embroidery has very specific motives and patterns and are indicative to the specific regions the wearer is from. Many of these patterns are rooted in ancient Slavic mythology and beliefs, which are to some extent still practiced and synchronized with their predominant Eastern Orthodox tradition. Ukrainians have also been huge on inventions and accomplishments. Things like CDs, bloodless blood tests, vaccines against the plague and cholera, postcode, kerosene lamps, and the first kidney transplant was performed in Ukraine as well. The list goes on. Of course, Ukraine has never shied away from the arts. You might find the whimsical Opishina ceramics in gift shops, usually depicting lions and rams. If that's not your thing, maybe go for some Petri Kiva. Literature is a huge pastime too. This guy is considered the first modern Ukrainian author. Taras Shevchenko is a national poet. And everyone knows Lesya Ukraina was one of the most famous writers that pushed for Ukrainian independence. Today, numerous monuments and six museums are dedicated to her honor, and she is even on their money. Many artists, filmmakers, and writers were suppressed during the Soviet times. Nonetheless, Ukrainian cinema has lived on. No movie more world-renowned and critically acclaimed than Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors. Yeah, if you want to see real authentic Ukrainian customs and traditions, Ukrainians will tell you to go to the Carpathian. That's where all the original stuff goes down. And another original thing Ukraine has is music. And let's see who's taking over the music segment because these days it switches off a lot. Honestly, anyone's better than Keith. Hey, what's going on everybody? It's Keith here. So I haven't been able to um, have enough time to even come up with a script. So our good friend Yvonne is gonna take it over. Also, I want to say a big shout out to the metal band Ginger. I love you guys. And uh, here is Yvonne with the music. Later, dogs. Hey, most of Ukrainians believe that musicality is one of the main features of Ukrainians. The oldest musical instruments found in Ukrainian territories is Triskochka and flutes from Mammoth, dated 20,000 years old. There are Ukrainian musical instruments like Lira, Kobza, Trubi, Surmi, Litavri, Sopilka, and so on. Pagan rituals still took place in Ukraine, such as Kupala, Malanka. So, a lot of Ukrainian songs have pagan elements. Also, there was Dumy, historical songs about knyaz, wars, etc. Dumy had been performed by Kobzars. They played Bandura or Kobza while singing, but during the Soviet era almost all of the Kobzars were killed. Kobza and Bandura were prohibited and confiscated, just like literally burned. Maxim Berezovsky, born 1745, basically the Ukrainian Mozart. Semen Gulak Artemovsky, author of the one of the first Ukrainian opera, Zaporozhye of the Name. Nikola Lysenko, born 1842, called the father of Ukrainian music. He also a father of USSR and Russian anthem, because his composition epic fragment was stolen and rearranged. 
Igor Starvinsky probably had a relationship with a Coco Chanel, has his own star in Hollywood. Mikola Leontovich, composer of probably one of the most known Ukrainian songs, Shedrick, or you may know it as Carol of the Bells. But Mikola hasn't seen his success because USSR's Bolsheviks killed him in 1921. Volodymyr Vasyuk, born 1949, writer of the best Ukrainian hit songs of that time, Chervona Ruta, Vdaleki Ori, was killed by KGB. Okay, Ukraine has taken part in the Eurovision contest since 2003 and even three times we took the first place. Kruslana in 2004, Jamala in 2016 and Kalush in 2022. So that's kind of all I gotta say. Marps. Thank you, Ivan. I remember one time though, I tried to whistle in a car and they, the guy yelled at me. He's like, don't whistle in a car. Yeah, that's really bad. <laughs> yeah, wh whistle, it's uh, in Ukrainian culture, it's uh, kind of like for bad luck. We've covered so much about the culture and the people and the demographics of Ukraine. Guess what? There's other people in this world and uh, Ukraine seems to interact with them. Which brings us to the last segment. So Ukraine and uh, friends around the world, it's uh, its just like their history. It's ever complicated and shifting. Always shifting, yes. Yeah. But uh, here's the animation. Let's get into it. First of all, to this day, it seems their number one foreign policy objective has been integration with the Euro-Atlantic Zone. In 2018, they officially ended their participation with the CIS, further cutting ties to Russia and other members, but mostly Russia. Outside of Europe, Canada was not only the second country in the world to recognize their independence, but actually has the largest Ukrainian diaspora at somewhere around 1.5 million, mostly concentrated in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Today, they have a free trade agreement and many cities are sister cities, including Kyiv with Toronto. The USA has the second largest Ukrainian diaspora in the Americas and has also been a key ally in more recent times as they, along with other countries, have pledged billions of dollars in aid during war times. High-level visits have been conducted by both heads of state and overall relations have grown since the 2010s. In Asia, it seems Turkey and China have an interesting role. Both have expressed interest in helping mediate somewhat in conflict. However, for the most part, they've been low-key and just business-oriented. Since 2008, China surpassed Russia as becoming Ukraine's largest trade partner, and in 2022, Chinese ambassador to Ukraine Fan Qianrong is quoted for saying that China will support Ukraine both economically and politically despite conflict times. Turkey is an interesting one. Not only have they both had historically strained relations with Russians, for Turks, dating back to Ottoman times, but Erdogan is also explicitly quoted for telling former president Poroshenko that Turkey would not recognize the annexation of Crimea. In addition, they are a major partner in Ukrainian exports across the Black Sea and do lots of business with them. Back in Europe, though, we get a more clear image of where the closest ties lie today. And since 2022, the EU has granted them candidate status for ascension to the EU, and Zelensky signed an EU membership application. Since then, they have also joined NATO's Enhanced Opportunity Partner Interoperability Program and have submitted an application for membership as well. Every Baltic country and Finland have expressed huge support for Ukraine since the onset of the war. Each side has a period of time understanding conflict with Russia. Their EU neighbors, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Germany, Czechia, and non-EU Moldova have all taken in many refugees during the war and have pledged support for Ukraine. The UK is a huge supporter. Immediately when you enter any British airport, you will see signs set up in the Ukrainian language offering assistance for refugees. In addition, they have pledged aid to Ukraine and are even in a trilateral security pact with Ukraine. When it comes to their best friend, almost every Ukrainian I have talked to has said Poland, which is the third member of the trilateral security pact. Poland has taken in the most refugees since the war. They share a bond based on history of understanding what life was like either under the Soviets or the Warsaw Pact. Their languages are pretty intelligible, and integration of Ukrainians into Polish society is incredibly easy for them. All of the drama of the former Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth years centuries ago is pretty much over and they've moved on. Ukrainians and Poles will always be there for each other. In conclusion, Misha, you are the Ukrainian. I'm gonna give this to you and I'm gonna head out. See ya. Ukraine, it's not just border. Ukraine, it's people, soul, culture. As long as Ukrainian people exist and culture, there will be always Ukraine and we will always fight for our freedom and uh, independence. Slava Ukraini! Thank you, Misha, for being in this episode. Really appreciate it. Uh, stay tuned. United Arab Emirates is coming up next.